as well. And Jesus says, listen, I'm not going to leave you alone. When I go back to my Father, when I go to this place where we're kind of reunited in a sense, I'm not going to leave you alone. I'm going to send the Holy Spirit. And that's where the third part of the Trinity comes in. He says this Holy Spirit is this constant connection with God, this phone line that is always open, this presence, this real presence that is with you always and only going to ever speak to you what I speak. And I only ever speak what my Father speaks, right? So that's the truth that we build our faith upon. It's the truth of the confirmation that God is God is God. And what he says is going to be consistent, right? Across the board. You know why that's so important? Because some people will be like saying, the Holy Spirit told me to do this. The Holy Spirit told me to do that. And I'm thinking, that sounds really strange, what the Holy Spirit told you to do, right? I actually sat in my office years ago. Years ago. Not anybody you would know, okay? Just put your knees. Years ago in my office. And this young man said to me, God told me that I was supposed to go to my girlfriend's house and we were supposed to sneak her out of her bedroom and go out and spend the night together. I said, God told you that? He's like, yeah, God told me that. I'm like, that's really strange. <laughs> so does it sound like you think God would do? He's like, no, no, Pastor, Pastor, listen to this. I prayed as I was sneaking up to her house. <laughs> God bless his soul. God bless his soul. He's probably following God right now. Saying God right now. He's like, I prayed if the dogs don't bark, then I'll know it's a sign for me. And pastor, the dogs do not bark. And inside the room, the girl was praying, Lord, if you really want me to speak out with my boyfriend tonight, then I just pray that uh, my parents won't wake up. And they didn't wake up. It must have been the Lord. You don't understand, Pastor, it was the Lord. And I'm like, okay. That's not consistent. <laughs> you know, that's not something that I think Jesus or his father would say to you. That's not something that I find is consistent with the truth about what he's revealed. You know, so we, we, can, we can have all kinds of reasons for why we do things, right? But Jesus said, listen, if you want to continue to follow me and my teachings and my way of life, then you're going to need the Holy Spirit to keep you connected to that. Amen. So that we don't wander off and get our own ideas. We wander off into our own things and become disconnected from the spirit that gives us life, right? And so Jesus prepares them in this passage that Alice had read. It says that over a period of 40 days, he appeared to them, right? And we talked about this in the weeks past, so I'm not going to spend too much time here, okay? But if you want to, you can go online and listen to the past sermons and, and fill yourselves in on that, okay? But I want to just briefly show how this reinforces what we've been talking about, Okay? He appeared to them, gave them many proofs that he was alive. Why is this important? Because our faith is based on objective evidence of eyewitness accounts, several hundred of them, that have been passed down through documentation, several thousand documents that we have of the New Testament. Okay, and we base it on the eyewitnesses' account. Why were there no books added to the Bible after a certain period of time? Because there were no longer any eyewitnesses or anybody that had spoken directly. It's what they witnessed to, it's what they wrote down, it's what they taught, because they spent that time with Jesus, right? Preparing, understanding that he is real, he is real, he is real, and we're going to base all of our lives and our teachings and the formation of this entire faith movement is going to be based on what happened in those 40 days. That Jesus is alive and we bear witness to it and we will swear upon our own lives. And they did that they were telling the truth. Jesus began to talk to them about the kingdom of God. He continued to teach them what the kingdom of God was like because he wanted them to know. And he told them that they needed to wait, not to get in a hurry, not to rush out. So this is a time of preparation that he's preparing them for, right? He said, listen, I need to prove to you and be with you and show you I'm alive. I need to teach you and talk to you about the kingdom of God. And I need you to wait because waiting is good, even though we don't like to wait, right? Even though we're an impatient people by nature, we don't like to wait. But the waiting is good. The waiting is part of God's preparation in your life. And if you feel like God's not doing anything in your life, well, maybe you're just in the season of waiting. And you need to trust that whether you feel it or not, Jesus said, I am always at work. 
I am always at work with my Father, and I am right now, right now, preparing your place in the kingdom. Amen? Amen. Right now, He is. And you've got to trust that. You've got to know that. You just are probably in a waiting period. Just a time where He says, wait right where you're at. And when the time comes, you're going to receive this power from on high. You're going to receive the Holy Spirit. And then you're going to know. Then you're going to have the power to do everything that I want you to do. Which is to proclaim this message. To be heralds of the good news. Heralds of the good news that God's love is real. And that he rose again from the dead to give us new eternal life that shall never end. The message of the kingdom of God. That God is renewing and restoring all things. So that they might be beautiful and lovely and joyful and life-giving for everyone. Once again, right? He's preparing them for that and then he's going to give them the power for that, right? And then Jesus leaves with a promise, right? That he will return, amen? Because he leaves, he goes up in the air and they stand there looking, looking. And again, maybe they were too literal. I don't think Jesus meant wait literally right there. <laughs> like, we're waiting, Lord, we're waiting. <laughs> And then two angels come and they go, why are you looking at the sky? Uh, because he told us to wait. We're just waiting. We don't know why. He's like, no, 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 listen. He's coming back again. He's coming back again. All right? You need to go. Go. Get together. Gather together. Pray. Wait for this power of the Holy Spirit to fall on you. And of course, next week is Pentecost Sunday. We're going to talk a lot about that. So I won't get too much into that, okay? And then people always want to know, this is where we can get off track, right? Like, oh, Jesus is coming again, right? That's always a fascinating topic for people, right? What's it going to look like when Jesus comes again? What's it going to look like in the end times, you know? Which, by the way, is not really the end. You know, and it's really just another beginning. So it's really about the future. You know, what is happening in the future? What's going to happen? So if you want to know or read about that, which again, I don't have time to get into, uh, there's several scripture places you can look to find out about the future. Daniel chapter 7 through 12, Matthew 24, Mark 13, Luke 21, and the book of Revelation, which is also called the Apocalypse, right? Which is about, we say, the end times, but it's really, I think, about the beginning of a whole new era, okay? So, now some of you may want those scripture verses that I talked about, and some of you, I've done a short outline of this whole passage of why each point is important, and I will send that to you on a text if you want it. That's why I gave you my phone number. All right, so you text me if you want my outline, because I'm not going to have time to do the whole thing. And if you want those verses on where you can read about what's going to happen at the end of the world and all that funky stuff, I will text that to you, okay? And, and you know, say a name if you don't mind, so I don't think you're some, you know, telemarketer. Well, I'll understand. <laughs> if you're asking, you're asking for the outline of the text. You got it? Everybody got it? Yes, That's why I got my phone number if you want it. And uh, because I won't have time to get to everything, and sometimes I forget to reference things, all right? Um... So what I want to start with is I want to take just a piece of that what's going to happen, okay? And I want to work with that for just a minute because I think that's important. This whole idea of going up, right? It's a directional thing that's caused us to think about heaven as being up there, right? Jesus being up there and somewhere else. If the heavens are above us, this is the earth below. Hell is somewhere down underneath. And some of you know, right, that that came when people saw the world kind of flat. Just kind of in layers, right? That kind of made sense. That helped them understand what was going on. Well, now we know that the world is not like a layer cake. It's this big globe, you know? And, and in a globe, in a three-dimensional world, what is up? You know, it's people on the other side of the world. We're upside down right now, right? Or they upside down. I mean, what is truly up? What is there? What is anywhere? I mean, I can have a space. I want, I want to know what is up and what is down, right? So it's not a directional thing so much anymore. Uh, but people use that because they thought that was helpful uh, just to symbolize something. You know, not to literally say it's way out there, you know, or, it's, or, or that it's up in a sense. But, but, that, but that somehow, you know, we, we needed to, to lift our gaze, you know, above what we're doing. Do you know that's why they built the cathedrals so big? They wanted people to look up. And then again, to symbolize, look up to God. Don't look at the things on this earth. Don't look down, you know, but lift your gaze. Lift your gaze up to what's going on, okay? Because what happens, what we find out is that they said here, Jesus is coming back, right? And Jesus said, I'm going to take you to be where I am. But then it gets changed a little bit, all right? It gets modified just a little bit. Because in the book of Revelation, in the book of the Apocalypse, John gets a vision of what's going to happen when Jesus comes again, all right? And when Jesus comes again, he says, look, this is what it's going to look like. This is from Revelation. Chapter 21. He said, I saw a new heaven 
and a new earth. Amen. For the first heaven and the first earth passed away, and there was no longer any sea. And I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Look, God's dwelling place is now among the people. Is now among the people. God's dwelling place is now among the people. So you see, in a funny kind of twist, we've all been thinking we're going to get ready to go because we're hopping on a train that's going to take us somewhere. We're hopping on a rocket ship that's going to get us out of this room. But at the end, heaven, wait a minute, heaven's coming to us. Man, isn't that awesome? You would be like getting all ready to go to your favorite concert, right? You're getting all ready, you're getting all ready, you got your friends ready, you're all dressed up, and you're going to hop in the car and drive your concert, and you open your door, and the concert is right there on your street. Right there. And everybody's there, and all the crowds are there, and all the music's there, and you're like, holy cow, this is amazing. I didn't have to go anywhere. It all came to me. Heaven is coming down, a new heaven. And a new earth, so that God's dwelling place won't be out there, far away, somewhere else. But it's going to be with us. I didn't know Jesus was making a mobile home. I mean, he's bringing his house and all the rooms with him. And it's coming down and saying, look, there's a new heaven and a new earth and everything is one. Oh man, that's amazing. That is amazing. That we will be together as one. And it's so, so important. Because it makes our work on earth important, right? So know that what we do for the kingdom right here and now does not pass away, amen? But it simply will be eternal. So that when Jesus comes again and everything that he has is eternal and everything that we've done for the kingdom of God, all the love and the justice and the places where we've done what is right and we've set people free and we've rescued people and we've healed diseases and we've cast out demons and we've thrown down corrupt governments and powers and where we've done all of these things, those things will begin to glow and shine and come together and form the kingdom of God that will last Forever and ever and ever. See, what we do here on this earth, and this is what I really tried to tell you this morning. I want to say it once and say it a couple more times. Is that what we do here on earth really does matter. Amen. You know why it matters? Because it's eternal. And, but it's not complete, friends. It's not, we can't get there all the way yet. But it's still worthwhile because it's not in vain. It's just waiting the consummation of Jesus coming with the new heaven and the new earth and everything coming together as one, fitting together, making sense, you know. No more tears, he says, no more sorrow, no more injustice. That's the world we got to look forward to, amen? That's the hope that we need. We're not talking about Jesus coming again anymore. We used to. We used to, and people would say, well, then forget about this world. Let's just focus on the next. And then people said, well, that's no good because people are dying all around us. And there's injustice. And, and there's just, there's a whole bunch of evil going on. So we need to work, right? God's given us the Holy Spirit power. Let's work, let's work, let's work, let's work. But if you don't have the end hope, then you'll become frustrated. And you'll become burned out. And at some point you'll think, why does it work? You need to both keep our eyes on this earth and keep our hope in heaven, Right? Were the disciples kind of rebuked for that? Like, don't just stand around looking up into the skies, all right? But spend your time working on earth. So what is the significance of Jesus' ascension? Then? If it's not to give us kind of a, a geographic or spatial picture of what Jesus did, here's what I believe it intends for us to do. It symbolizes his ascension that he is now in authority at the right hand of God. So the apostles will later see his ascension as a confirmation that he is not ascended so much in the physical realm, but politically, with authority, with power, he is ascended to sit at the right hand of God, and as such, he has all authority and all power. And that's what the ascension of Christ is really about, that Jesus Christ has the power and the authority so that we one day might see the Father and be one. At the end of our journey is the Father. And it's the kingdom of God. It's everything God wants this world to be. So Jesus says, not only am I giving you the power to bring about this kingdom right now, but I'm giving you the authority that I have in my name to bring about this kingdom right now. While it won't be complete, and you will be frustrated, and you will want to give up, you will see life. You will see people healed. You will see lives transformed. You will see goodness. You will see it. Because we got to have both, friends. we got to have both. We can't have one or the other. 
We need to focus on what's going on in this world and be engaged in it. And we have to have a hope that there is still a better world that's coming. Amen. Heaven is both here and now. And it is both then and later. Amen. It is both. It is the real kingdom of God. Can I talk about one more thing for a minute? Yeah, sure. Okay, because the disciples are right. What did they say to Jesus? They're always saying something that's not quite right. Amen. God bless them. Because that feels like me. <laughs> you know, they're just that they just don't always get it. Anyone here feel like you just don't get it sometimes? You're in good company. Amen. This word is for you. God can use you. They don't get it. They say, Lord, at this time you're going to restore the kingdom of Israel. And I just imagine that Jesus went, Oh, what? Because he'd been talking about the kingdom of God. And then what did he want about the kingdom of Israel? He's like, really? Really? That's what you're concerned about. Your nation, your national pride, your cultural pride, you're the Jewish people. I've been talking to you about the kingdom of God. Hallelujah. And I've been telling you that you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. So I'm talking the ends of the earth, you're thinking about Israel. I'm talking about the kingdom of God, you're thinking about the political and military and economic and cultural power of the Israelites. And you know what their question kind of sounds like to me? Are you going to restore the kingdom to Israel? It kind of sounds like this. Are you going to make Israel great again? Oh. Are you going to make Israel great again? Is it, isn't it about us? Isn't it about us, God, and the power and the political might we need to have? And what does Jesus say? Jesus always rebukes so gently. He says, it's not for you to the times. My Father has said. In other words, let's get back to my Father, the one who is in control, the one who gives me the power and the authority I have. Okay, this is his world. And everything in it. Okay? But you will receive power. Listen, you will receive power. Regardless of what your nations do, regardless of what the Roman Empire is going to do, regardless of what any political structure on earth is going to do, God says, I will give you power, amen? amen. I will give you the Holy Spirit so that you might accomplish the bringing about of the kingdom of God. And that's way more important than the kingdoms of this earth. And we need to keep our focus on the kingdom of God and his return. So that while we work on this earth, we understand that there is something better that's coming. We understand that, yes, while we must live and work as people who live here on this earth, there is something more. I would need to even challenge me this week because we want to focus on and bless the city of Hartford. We want to focus on Hartford. But you know what? It's even bigger than Hartford. There's going to come a point where we're going to have to say we can't just look at Hartford. It's got to be bigger than that. In fact, someone came to me and he said, why are you just thinking about Hartford? Why not Connecticut? Why not New England? Why not the United States? Because you see, I believe, oh my gosh, some of you got to hear me on this. you got to hear me on this. I'm making a kingdom of God statement, not a political statement. Any political statement I can make is down here and must be submissive to the kingdom of God, no matter what those politics are. And the kingdom of God statement I'm making is this, is that you have the power, we have the power to make a real difference in this world, right? Amen. To make a real difference in this world. And when we do that, friends, when we do that, then America is going to be great again. And not only America, but Canada is going to be great again. Why do people laugh when say Canada? Canada's worthwhile. And Mexico will be great again. And Europe will be great again. And Africa and Asia will be great again because they're starting to come into an understanding of the kingdom of God and that God's love is for everyone and everyone he cares about, okay? And notice how he says, listen, you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem. It's the same thing. Don't ignore what's going on. No, no. Don't ignore our politics right now. It's important that we pay attention to our politics. It's important that we participate. But I want to participate under the authority of Jesus Christ, Amen. I want to know my word more than I know my politics so that my word can influence how I feel about my politics. Amen. And I want to be connected to Jesus, who is the King of kings and the Lord of lords and the Prince of peace and the one who is above all authorities, rules, and powers. So that I know where my real life is. So that I don't have to operate out of fear or anger or judgment. 
I know it's hard to hear. But as a Christian, you do not have to operate out of fear or anger or judgment. But the kingdom of God, Romans 14 says, the kingdom of God is a matter of righteousness and joy and peace in the Holy Spirit. I can be concerned about righteousness and justice. And I can be concerned about peace. And I can do it with joy, amen? amen. I can do it with joy in my heart. That I think, man, if there was just someone who just had a bunch of joy and smiled a lot, I think they, they'd probably flip this whole thing around. You know, I think people would be drawn to someone who truly understands what joy is and has a positive outlook and believes in what can happen. That's what God calls us to. Not to be pessimist, not to be optimist, but to be realist. And a realist is someone who says, look, there's a lot of work that needs to be done. And I need to do it. And if it's in politics, then I need to get involved. You know, that's tough. I need to do it in politics. If it's in the schools, I need to do it in the schools. If it's through the social system, I need to do it through that. If it's through my church, I need to do it through that, right? If it's through my school, I need to do it through that. If it's just my family, trying to help out another family, I need to do that, right? I need to just engage in this world because God's given me the power by the Holy Spirit to engage and to make a difference. Your prayers can make a difference. Are you anxious? Are you worrisome? Are you fearful of this election in this country? How much have you prayed, friends? How much have you prayed because the power of God is greater than the power of man? How much have you asked for the Holy Spirit to come upon God's men and women so that they stand up and speak truth and make a difference in this world? Let's pray for them. That's what we need. That's what God's called us to live. The best example I can think of this, one of the best, is really Martin Luther King Jr. And this is where I close this morning. Because he is someone who literally gave his life for the causes that he believed in, right? And he spoke in the church, and he spoke in the political realm. And he spoke to the culture. And he spoke to the culture that he was a part of, and he spoke to the culture that he was not a part of. And he was concerned about the here and now, but he also believed that God was coming again. And he knew that the eternal hope lie in the return of Christ the King. At the end of one of his speeches, one of my favorite speeches, he said, I know many of you are looking at this vision that I have for a peaceful world where blacks and whites can get along together. And I said, I know that many of you are thinking, how long till we see this? How long do we have to look at the bodies of black men and women lying in the streets of our cities? Sounds like today, doesn't it? Amen. How long, God, till we have this healing, till we have this this reconciliation? And he concludes his speech by saying, I come to you this afternoon because I want you to know that no matter how frustrating the moment, no matter how difficult the hour, it will not be long because truth that is crushed to the earth will rise again. How long? Not long because no lie can live forever. How long? Not long because you shall reap what you sow. How long, not long, truth is forever on the scaffold and wrong forever on the throne, yet the scaffold sways the future. And beyond the dim unknown stands God in the shadows, keeping watch above his own. How long, not long, because the arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends towards justice. How long, not long, because my eyes have seen the coming of the glory of the Lord. With his grapes of wrath are stored. He hath loosed the faithful lightning of his terrible swift sword. His truth is marching on. Amen. Glory, hallelujah. hallelujah. Glory, hallelujah. Glory, hallelujah. His truth is marching on. Let's pray. Oh God Almighty. God Almighty. Father in heaven, Jesus Christ at the right hand of our Father, Holy Spirit that lives and dwells among us and brings us right into that throne presence. Oh God. We humble ourselves before you today. God, we kneel in this place, God. God, our world is hurting. We're hurting, God. We are crying out for relief. 
We are crying out for hope. We are crying out for justice. We are crying out for truth. And how we long, God, that someone would stand up in our day and age and lead us. And lead us by your truth. And by your word, God. Oh, my Lord. My Lord. We confess, God, we put our hope in so many other things. But Lord, today I want us to put our hope in the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives. But I want to put my hope in the work of the Holy Spirit in this community, God. I want to put my hope in the work of the Holy Spirit in this city of Hartford, Connecticut, God. That the power of the Holy Spirit would fall and that you would motivate your people to make a change in this city, God. Lord, I pray your Holy Spirit in the places where decisions are being made, Lord, in the city hall and in the Capitol and in the legislative buildings, God, of Connecticut. I pray for your Holy Spirit, God. I pray for your Holy Spirit, Lord. And would you raise up mighty women and mighty men who work for your truth and justice in the power of the Holy Spirit and the hope of your coming again. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Pastor. Holy Spirit, I pray that you search our hearts this morning. Holy Spirit, search our hearts. Show us what needs to be changed. If you are one who feels like you've been wandering, if you're one who feels like you've been hopeless, if you're one who feels like you've been far away from God, would you hear the message we've saw and said this morning? Wanderer, you're not too far. You can come home this morning. We invite you to come home. We invite you to receive Jesus Christ. And you can do that by just saying yes to God. Just saying yes to the Lord. Lord, I pray that you would fill us again with your Holy Spirit. That you would empower us once more. I want to pray for some of you this morning. I believe that God is speaking to some people here. And it's been a long time since you've used the power of the Holy Spirit. In life. And this is the image you gave you. The Holy Spirit is sitting out in the garage of your life. It's still there. It's still there. But you have an opportunity to that flow in a long time. In a long time. I just invite you to receive the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit. Invite the worship team to come up. I'd like us to conclude by singing it again. Hey man, it's a good time to sing. We got people trying to sing already. I hear you. Let's lift up our voices. Hey man, invite you to stand. Let's sing we believe.
lunch. Uh, we have a kind of a brunch thing again today, and uh, with some eggs and different things. And you go outside and have the light in the cafeteria. Um, if you're visiting with us, uh, we have gift bags right out here. We'd love you to take one. Um, I just brought some more this morning, so if you've missed them last couple weeks, there's some gift bags out there. We'd love you to take that. Um, if you have a silver Honda, your car lights are on in the outdoor parking lot. So if you have a silver Honda, you might want to slip out and make sure your batteries are going, all right? And we're going to conclude this morning, and then we'll leave with the Lord's Prayer together, which I believe also encapsulates um, of what this passage from Acts is all about. So let's pray together the Lord's Prayer, and then we'll be dismissed. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name.